Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. You could have been out there in the beautiful sunshine. You could be watching football. Anyway, I'm here to confuse you about time. If Sue, if Sue confused you about consciousness, I will confuse you about time. Why am I talking about time? Because a few years ago, I was asked to write a book about time. And I did write, and there it is. This is the, the front cover. And I brought one copy, and somebody bought it. Thank you. Who bought it? <laughs> Wonderful. I'm very kind. I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. So I, when they said, would I write a book about time, I said, yes, that'll be easy. I can look up a few things and buy some other books. And I bought, I went on Amazon, and I bought 23 books about time. And they're all completely different. Some of them are about the second law of thermodynamics and time's arrow and the future of the universe. And some of them were about managing your time and being more efficient in the office. But none of them were doing the things I wanted to do, which was to cover all aspects of time. And I wanted to unravel the mystery to find out what time is all about. And uh, I then discovered you needed a whole lot of science to look at time. And I wondered what sort of science you need. You need philosophy or measurement or biology or psychology or physics. Well, we'll try all of those. And I hope you all are well trained in all these sciences, because otherwise you won't understand. If you do understand, please explain to me, because I need to know what time is all about. All right, we'll start with a little philosophy. Aristotle was a philosopher. Greek, didn't live very far from here. He probably ate Bulgarian food. This is probably what gave him his ideas. <laughs> and he said that time is all about movement and change. And if there was no movement and no change, there would be no time, which gives rise there's obviously movement going on there. <laughs> so there's time going on off stage, even if not on stage, which gives rise to the idea, suppose we were to all to freeze for 10 minutes, or for 100 years, for that matter. Everything froze. The us, the animals, the, the traffic, the stars in the sky, everything froze for 100 years. And then we all woke up. Would time have passed? Uh, and would we know? And it's very hard. If, if time is all about movement and there is no movement, then, according to Aristotle, there would be no time. But, of course, Isaac Newton said exactly the opposite. Newton said, this is in Principia in 1687, absolute true and mathematical time flows equably without relation to anything external. So it says here, Isaac Newton, 1687. So he said that time goes on even if there is no movement, no change. Time is still ticking away. And this is the sort of argument the philosophers have been having for at least 2,000 years and will probably go on having, because time, nobody's quite sure what time is. Well, measuring time probably started with sundials. The sundial is very simple. You put a stick in the ground and you look at the shadow moving around in the sun. The stick is called a gnomon. This is an English sundial, and the angle of the gnomon should be the same as your latitude. So in England, we're at about 52 degrees. The angle between the gnomon and the horizontal should be about 52 degrees. It should point at the North Star in the Northern Hemisphere. Then you get the best reading as the shadow moves around. Unfortunately, sundials, although obviously they give you correct time by the sun, don't give you correct time by coordinated universal time or Greenwich Mean Time because that is an average. And the sundial can give you a time that is up to 14 minutes wrong at, on particular times of the year. So if you have a sundial, don't blame it for being late for a meeting, because it may be wrong, even if the sun isn't. And unfortunately, sundials are not much good in England, because we have clouds all the time. We haven't seen the sun <laughs> since 1687. Oh, no, that's not quite true. <laughs> we haven't seen the sun for a long time. And of course, they're completely useless at night. So you had to have some way of carrying time through the night. During the day, the ancients divided time, uh, divided the daylight, rather, into 12 hours. So when you woke up, that was the first hour, and when you went to bed, that was the end of the 12th hour, and in between you had 12 hours, which were obviously longer in the summer than in the winter. So the Romans had Hora Prima was the first hour, Hora Septima the seventh hour, that's when you had your midday meal, and so on and so forth. Then, of course, what do you do in the night? Well, they had various different systems. And now, could we switch? Vasi, is she here? No, she's gone. Oh, well, oh, there she is. I can see her. We now have to switch to this camera. I don't believe this is going to work, but they tell me it will work. The, thank you. Look at this. 
Uh, this is a picture of what I have on the table. And what the ancient uh, Indians used was this. This is a gati, or in other words, a half coconut shell with a small hole drilled in the bottom. And if I drop it in this bucket of water, the water will gradually leak in and it will sink after exactly 30 seconds. Anyone want to time it? No. All right. <laughs> I'm putting it in now. And the water gradually leaks in. And, of course, the monks would have had a beautiful bronze gati. And it was timed to sink in exactly 24 minutes. That was the ancient Indian hour. And then they would bang a gong and float it again, and it would sink. And they would do that 60 times in the day, 60 hours of 24 minutes. And there's a very sad story about a girl called Lilivati, who was the daughter of a famous mathematician. And she was told by the soothsayers there was only one propitious moment for her to marry. Now, this is very tense. Can you see it on the screen? Oh, it's gone. I missed it. Anyway, she was very tense about this moment for her to marry, and she leant over the, the uh, bowl like this, and a pearl from my headdress fell in and blocked the hole in the gati. And she missed the moment, and she could never be married. Do you believe that? No. Oh, oh you skeptics, you. The ancient Greeks used a rather different method. They called it a klepshydra, or water thief. And this is my klepshydra. Um, it may look like a cat food tin, but this is a, an almost exact replica, a replica of an ancient Greek klepshydra, and it has a small hole in the bottom. I'm putting my finger over the hole in the bottom. You can probably see the hole in the bottom on the screen. Uh, I can't tell. Right. I fill it with water, and suppose I'm in court charged with parking my chariot on a double yellow line or some other terrible crime. <laughs> then they start, they fill it up, they let the water start coming out, and I am allowed to speak until the water runs out or until the water stops running out. That is my time for speaking. So this obviously marks a simple amount of time. This is a one-minute clepsydra, and you could make a 10-minute clepsydra or a 20-minute clepsydra, but again, it's no use for marking continuous time. You couldn't say when it is 10 o'clock in the morning. But a clever Greek called Tisibios in the 3rd century BC adjusted the clepsydra. He arranged that it had a steady flow in at the top and was always full, so the water always ran out at the bottom at a steady speed, and he put a float in the receiving vessel, and the float went up, and the pointer marked the hours. So you could read the hours all through the night. And what's rather nice about this is that the flow gets less and less, and it goes to a dribble, and then drips, and then quite suddenly it stops dead. And if I were in court, that would be when I... There, it stopped. That would be when I had to stop speaking. There is a story, which I can't obviously substantiate, that there was a, a lady of the night in ancient Greece who used to time her customers. She was called Klepsydra, and she used to time her customers using a device of this sort. <laughs> but, of course, that may be just a story. <laughs> anyway, now we need to go back to the, uh, to the slides, please. So that was how um, clocks began. After the sundial came the water clock. And then along came a famous Italian scientist, Galileo. He was, he was a very brilliant man. Um, he oscillated between Pisa and Padua and Florence, or his home, which was uh, Arcetri near Florence. Um, and he made three great discoveries in his life. And the first one was to do with time. He was sitting in the cathedral in Pisa. Has anyone here been to Pisa? Yes, a few. It's a most beautiful, small city, and there is this green space in the middle of it with three white buildings, the baptistry, the cathedral or Duomo, and the Leaning Tower. Magical white buildings in a straight line in this green space. And uh, he was sitting in the Duomo, in the cathedral, which is beautiful. If you have a chance, go there. I'm not into cathedrals, but this is really lovely. And here is a picture of the inside. Uh, I'm pressing more. Yes, here we are. Here is the inside, and you'll see that there's a great bronze lamp here, which is hung on an enormously long chain from the very top of the dome. And he noticed he was bored with listening to the sermon, and he noticed the bronze lamp was swinging in the breeze from the door. And sometimes it swung just a few centimeters, and sometimes the door opened and there was a draft, and it would swing several meters each way. And he thought it would be interesting to see how long it took for each swing. And of course, uh, watches and clocks hadn't been invented then, so he timed it with his pulse. 
And he measured this swing, and he discovered it didn't matter whether it swung a little bit or a lot. It always took the same time for each swing, which was actually many seconds, because it's a very long string. And he went home, and he investigated pendulums. And he found that if you have a little short pendulum, like this one, this string is about 20 centimeters long. Um, oh, I may have to hold it by hand. Um, this would swing either way in less than a second. It's a very quick swing. But on the other hand, if you had a long pendulum like this one, this will take a whole second from sw to swing from one side to the other. So from there to there is one second. In fact, the length of the pendulum you need for that is 99.6 centimeters, almost exactly a meter. Uh, in, and it was suggested that this should be the way of, of defining the second. If you have a 99.6 centimeter pendulum, it would swing in a fixed time of one second. Unfortunately, the force of gravity <coughs> varies slightly from place to place on the Earth. So that would mean the second varied, and that would not be a good thing. But he realized that the only thing that matters for the time of the swing is the length of the string. Doesn't matter how far it swings, doesn't matter how heavy the thing is on the end, just the time of the swing. Now, I need, need a volunteer. Could I have a volunteer for a minute, please? This is not very dangerous. <laughs> Let's have a volunteer. This lady here would be fine. Thank you very much. Now, are you alive? <laughs> yes? Could I borrow your hand, please? Right, I, I, well, I don't mind. This one will do fine. Now, has she got a pulse? Oh, yeah. Oh, a very good pulse. Excellent. Now, <laughs> what I've got to do is to set this swinging and try and get... It's very nearly right. I want to shorten the string a little bit to make this swing a little bit quicker. Wind it round once. Try again. This is a very impressive pulse. Are you sure that's real? <laughs> yes, her pulse is going donk, 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 exactly in time with the string. So now we can read off the speed. You've got a fast between fast and medium. He, didn't, he could have done it in seconds, but he didn't have seconds. So that's very healthy. You'll probably live at least another five minutes, maybe, maybe to the end of the <laughs> Thank talk. You. Yeah. Thank you very much. A round of applause. Thank you. Now, Galileo was a medical student in, in Pisa, and he realized this was going to be really useful because if he had patients who were feverish, he could measure the time of their pulse and see if it was very fast, and then he'd know they had a fever. And the authorities realized this was very important, and they stole the idea and gave him no credit at all. So he was a little bit cross about that. But he also had the idea that you could use a pendulum to regulate a mechanical clock. If you had some means of driving a clock and driving maybe just a bell ringing or something like that, you could use a pendulum to regulate it because it has such a regular swing. He designed such a clock but never got round to building it. And the first ever pendulum clock was built by the Dutch polymath, Christian Hagens. I spent some time in the Netherlands and I asked a lot of Dutch people how you say this name and they say Hagens, Hagens. Would you practice please? Hagens. Thank you very much, yes. He would be proud of you. He, he was a very brilliant man. He was an astronomer, a mathematician, and, and a, you know, a physicist. He worked in the Netherlands. He worked in Paris, worked in London. Great friend of people like Christopher Wren and probably Isaac Newton. And he worked out how to build a pendulum clock and built the first one in 1657. After that, many, many people built pendulum clocks, and they are still wonderful clocks. Do you have grandfather clocks here? Long, long case clocks. I have one that my father bought in a sale. Uh, lovely old thing. Uh, keeps very good time, has a lovely strike, and they depend usually on a one meter pendulum, swinging each way once a second. <coughs> but of all the people who have made grandfather clocks, my favorite was this man, John Harrison, who invented the marine chronometer. He was born in Yorkshire in England, and they moved uh, over to South Humberside, and he was really, he became the village carpenter. He used to make doors and windows and furniture. But he also loved clocks, and he repaired old clocks that had gone wrong and began to make his own clocks. And because he was a carpenter, he made his clocks from wood. And here is the mechanism of one of his clocks, which is still around today. And you'll see that all the cogwheels are made of wood. This is oak, and this is one sort of oak for the middle, and then all the teeth are arranged with the grain running outwards radially from the center for maximum strength. And the, of all the clocks of his that survive, and there are, are quite a few, 
My favorite one of all is this one at Brocklesby Park. It's in the stable block. So here there is the stable block, and there are horses all the way around the bottom. And up in the top, there is the clock face. And here is the mechanism with some stupid idiot standing in front of it. <laughs> this clock he built in 1722. It is still running today. They wind it once a week. It loses about one minute a week, and they just adjust it. And it has never been lubricated. He made all these spindles <laughs> here. You can just see spindle and there out of brass, and they sat in pieces of wood of lignum vitae. It's a very hard wood, which is sort of greasy. It's as though it was self-lubricating. He realized that if he put oil on, it would sooner or later gum up and get covered in dust, and the clock would stop. But by using lignum vitae, the brass would go on slipping, and it would never need lubricating. This has never been lubricated in 300 years, and still runs to this day. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> well, I was so impressed with uh, Harrison, I decided to build my own wooden clock to demonstrate how a mechanical clock works, because I didn't really understand, and it may be that one or two of you don't understand either. So here is my clock. It's very simple. It has, in fact, only two moving parts. Well, two and a half moving parts. But it has all the three important features that a, clock, a mechanical clock needs. So first of all, it has a power source. It has this weight. All long case clocks have weights. You wind up once a week and they pull down. So this has a little um, weight of, of ash, which is 70 grams. And that pulls round, or tries to pull round, this wheel. You see there's a string coming up from the weight, and it's trying to pull this wheel round. It's wrapped round the axle at the back. And this is actually the escape wheel. It has 15 teeth. They're made of oak with the grain running outwards, and it has one hand. You see the white hand sticking upwards. And then it has a pendulum, which is a one-meter pendulum with a, a weight at the bottom just to keep it swinging. And I made this collapsible so that I could carry it around the world, but it's tra traveled rather too much, and it's suffered. So I don't have it with me, but I do have a movie of it running. And these critical bits are at the top of the um, pendulum. You'll see right at the top, you can't quite see. You'll see it attached to that piece of wood. And at the very top, there are these pallets which interact with the teeth of the escape wheel so that when you pull the pendulum to one side, what happens here is the escape wheel is trying to turn around and this tooth is blocked by that pallet. And it can't move until the pendulum swings and lets it escape through. That's why it's called the escape wheel. So each time the pendulum swings to and fro, one tooth will get through. Now, the pendulum takes two seconds to go to and fro, and there are 15 teeth. So the theory is that the white hand should take 30 seconds to make one revolution. And now, is she there? Yes, please. We need to switch over to the movie mode, and I don't dare do it. So just talk among yourselves for a minute. So we need to come out of PowerPoint and pick up the movie. There we are. Here it goes. Going away. Now you can hear it going tick-tock as the teeth hit the pallets. That's why a clock goes tick-tock. That's lovely. And I don't know if you were timing that, but there was a little slip in the middle. It actually takes 27 seconds to make a revolution. So I'm quite happy with that. But the point is to demonstrate, well, I'm sorry, if you were unhappy, tough. <laughs> you make a better wooden clock. Um, the point was to demonstrate how a clock works. You need these three things. You need the power source. You need a, a regulator, in this case the pendulum, and you need something to connect them together and count the movements of the regulator. So in this case, that was the escape wheel, which actually moves forward one click every two seconds. Nowadays, of course, most watches work. Yes, could I go back to the... Thank you. A small temporal error.
Good, good. Nowadays, of course, we all have watches or clocks powered by quartz. And quartz is a natural mineral. It doesn't usually come as beautiful as this, but occasionally. And what they do is they take a tiny crystal and they cut it with a laser to a little Y shape. And the curious feature of quartz is that if you apply an electrical voltage across a crystal, it will start vibrating. It's called piezoelectric. And if you have the crystal cut to exactly right, the right size, it will vibrate 32,000 times every second. 32,000 times. Actually, to be precise, 2 to the 15 times every second. And you have a counter in there which simply counts in binary up to 2 to the 15 and then clicks on one second. And you can cut the quartz so accurately that your watch probably stays accurate to within a second a week or something like that. It's very remarkable. The only thing more precise than a quartz <coughs> clock or a watch <coughs> is an atomic clock, which is how we get coordinated universal time. So that's all I want to say about time measurement. I could go on for hours, but I can hear the snores already. So <coughs> let's talk about some rather peculiar things, like biology and the moon. What's the moon got to do with time? Well, the month, of course, is roughly the time between successive full moons. The month now averages about, 20, about 30 days. Every new, the, the, sorry, the full moon comes around every 29 days or so, but it's a, an approximate measure. Hence, moon, month, it's the same word. But here is a bone <coughs> that was dug up in Africa. It's 20,000 years old. And it's carved with notches. And the notches, this is just the two sides of the same bone. The, t the, the notches seem to be in groups of 29, the number of days between successive full moons. So was this a lunar calendar? That there are no instructions, of course. They didn't have written language 20,000 years ago. So even in Japanese, there are no instructions. <laughs> but was it perhaps a woman trying to keep track of her fertility? Was it, was it some lad who was out there at night and his, his iPod wasn't working and the TV was on the blink and all he had to watch was these things in the sky and he was trying to make some sense out of them? We don't know, but clearly it was of some interest to people 20,000 years ago. And then <coughs> these fish are called grunion. They wash up like this on the beach in California about this time of the year, about April, May, June. And they wash up on the night of the full moon. In their millions, you can just see, you can hardly see the sand between the fish. Millions of them. And on the next wave, they're gone. So what are they doing? Well, the answer is when they're there, they spawn, and all the eggs and the sperm go into the sand. The eggs get fertilized, and there are then two whole weeks before the next spring high tide. The spring high tide is the highest of the high tides. It follows immediately after the full moon and after the new moon. So there are two weeks between spring high tides. So all those um, developing eggs uh, or embryos are undisturbed for two weeks. And then comes the next spring high tide, and they are washed back into the sea. And by that time, they're old enough to survive in the, in the open sea. So it's only if these fish come up all together at the same time that they can get their embryos to survive. And somehow they know when it's full moon. How do they know? Can you imagine them all lying offshore, millions of them, looking up? No, it's not quite full. <coughs> Let's go and have another drink. <laughs> Somehow they know. This is an old friend of ours. <coughs> Excuse me, I must have some water. <coughs> he lives just near us at home in Devon in South England. We live right by a river. You can see the river over his shoulder. It's called the River Urm. It comes straight down off Dartmoor and goes out to the sea. And there are fish in that river. And in one week, he caught two <coughs> salmon, two eight-pound salmon. This fish fed ten of us Christmas Eve. Absolutely wonderful fish. And I asked George, what, how do you know when to come? You could come all season, the six months of season. He said, oh, I, I always come up at the full moon. That's, <coughs> <coughs> That's when the fish go up the river to spawn. Why? <coughs> do they need to see their way? Do they, do they feel, is it a magnetic thing? Is it a gravitational thing? Is the gravity different if the moon and the sun are in line? We don't know. We have no idea. <coughs> Yet it seems to affect plants too. <coughs> There's a Swiss tree expert, Professor Zürcher, who tells me that trees actually swell up in the full moon by only a fraction of a millimeter, but a little bit, and then down again afterwards. 
And he says that if you plant tree seeds at the right quarter of the moon, they will germinate faster than ones sown at other times, and they will grow faster. <coughs> and there's now a huge industry of lunar planting. You can go online and find all sorts of instructions and charts. And it says that if you want to plant leaf crops, that's cabbages and spinach, you plant them in the first quarter after the new moon. If you want to plant fruit crops, peas, beans, tomatoes, plant them in the second quarter. Root crops, carrots, onions, potatoes in the third quarter, and nothing in the fourth quarter. <laughs> well, we have the chart. It's, we, we laminated it. It's up in the greenhouse. And what we do is, if we've got the bean seeds, which maybe we haven't, but if we've got them, then we plant them when we remember if it's not raining, which is not quite the way you should do it. What we should do is plant them every day for a month and see which one, but we're not quite as scientific as that. But if you want to believe this, you could try it out or even just follow the instructions. And there is a huge industry in this. So the moon has a lot of influence on our lives. <coughs> in... Um, <coughs> the first sentence of this book says something like, uh, people have wondered for thousands of years why fish, plants, and women have cycles linked to the moon. And the Americans objected to the word women. I don't quite understand why. There must be women in the United States. Anyway, I think they changed the sentence very slightly for the American edition. Those of you who bought the paperback here, whoever was here, look at the first sentence and see if the word women appears. If not, I think that's the American edition. <laughs> now, where do we go from here? We go to psychology, how we perceive time. And this is, well, it was actually a huge section in the book. I'm keeping it very short here. I just want to talk about the rhythms, the normal rhythms. We normally live by the sun. Obviously, we, most of us get up when the sun is up, and most of us go to bed when the sun goes down, or a bit afterwards. So we have what's called a circadian rhythm, or diurnal rhythm. Circadian meaning about a day. So you probably wake up somewhere over on the left here, um, about eight or nine, and then you... Oh, you can't quite see it. You don't have to have a bowel movement at 8.30. <laughs> it's not obligatory, but that's maybe when you feel like it. And then you have high alertness at 11 o'clock. That's when you should do your deals on the internet and buy your clothes and that sort of stuff. Early afternoon, best coordination and fastest reaction times uh, early in the afternoon, so you should be playing your video games and playing table tennis and that sort of thing then. Maximum blood pressure, 8, 18, 6, 30. That's just after your first gin and tonic or, or beer or, or whatever you drink in this country. The, the beer seems to be quite good. I've had a few. And, and maximum temperature is still going up. Bowel movements suppressed after about 10.30 for obvious reasons. And then your deepest sleep and your lowest body temperature in the early hours of the morning which is why it feels so horrible if you get woken up at two or three. You really feel you've got to climb out of a deep pit to get back to waking. And that's why it's so horrible for shift workers, firemen, uh, doctors, ambulance drivers, and so on. People who have to work through the night, it's very, very difficult to change your body clock. You can do it for a bit, but then you relapse into the old times and you start going to sleep in the middle of the night. One man who tried to experiment was this. <coughs> Michel Sifre was a French cave, uh, cave diver, I mean cave man. He loved, he loved uh, ca caver is what I'm after. He loved exploring caves, speleologist to those scientists among us. And in 1962, he went down into a cave deep under the French Alps. And he spent two months down there without any clock or watch or anything. He had artificial light, but there was no daylight coming in, so he had no clue as to what the time was. And every day when he woke up, he would pick up a telephone and ring his friends on the surface and say, good morning, and they would note the time. And then he would count to 20 in what he thought was two counts a second. So one, two, three, so on. And um, actually they noticed that his good morning came later and later until he was saying good morning at six o'clock in the evening. And his natural rhythm was obviously not 24 hours, but nearer to 25. And he'd slip back to his natural rhythm after a week or two down there. 
And it turns out, in fact, that most of us have a natural rhythm longer than 24 hours, maybe 24 and a half, maybe 25, and we're all only brought back to 24 hours by cues in the morning. It may be the sun coming up, it may be the alarm clock, it may be your partner prodding you, saying, I want my tea, that's what happens to me. <laughs> it may be the, uh, your children or your animals jumping on your face demanding food, but something wakes you up in the morning and you're usually half asleep and you get up. We're probably all slightly deprived of sleep because we're woken up before we've got through our 24 hours. Well, then his counting, one, two, three, after a couple of weeks, he was going one, two, three. So obviously his rapid body clock had gone wrong too. He totally missed what a second was. It had disappeared, his, his um, internal measurement. And when he came up again, um, he said, oh, I must have been down for six weeks. But no, he'd been down for two whole months. He was 14 days out. He'd lost count of the days as well. So it just shows if you're really deprived of cues, external cues, your body clocks, various body clocks, go haywire. So we need daylight to keep us back into normal daily rhythm. Now, emergencies. It's a bit funny, this computer, isn't it? It didn't look like this on mine. Anyway, <laughs> emergencies. Um, I don't know whether you've ever been in a car crash or some such thing when time suddenly seems to go very, very slowly. I had occasional, occasion to think about this when I was, I was paid to drop tomatoes off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Uh, not many people get paid to do that. It was, <laughs> it was wonderful. But I am terrified of heights. I'm really, really scared. And the walkway is about that wide. It's polished marble. It's sloping, of course, because the tower is sloping. There are trip hazards. And the safety rail is about that high and very rusty. So you could easily slip and go straight down. It's 50 meters high. So it would take just over three seconds to hit the ground. I worked it out. Uh, I was just reckoning that my entire life could go through my, before my eyes in three seconds. And if you ever see the movie, you'll see I'm gripping the rail like this as I go around. I never let go. I was not going to let go. But I have to say that dropping tomatoes off was wonderful. And it was very interesting. I dropped them off. The idea was I'm following in the footsteps of Galileo, who dropped things off the Leaning Tower in 1590. Uh, we chose tomatoes because they're very Italian and biodegradable, and we thought they wouldn't, probably wouldn't kill the tourists underneath with their, their cameras. Um, I dropped them with the uh, stalk upwards, and they fell all the way down like that. And when they hit the ground, they didn't explode. They just split all the way around the outside like Chinese lanterns and stayed in one piece. So there was no mess. We just picked them all up and took them away. It was very neat. And the big one and the little one dropped at the same time, landed at exactly the same time. So that was very satisfying. Big things and little things fall at the same speed. Aristotle was wrong. Galileo was right. We proved it. Anyway, the, the point of this was being frightened of falling. And fortunately, there's a man in, in uh, Texas who wanted to investigate this. This is Professor David Eagleman. He built a tower 50 meters high, just the same height as the Leaning Tower. And guess what he dropped off the top? People. Students. <laughs> now, if there are any students here who would like to volunteer, I, I can give you proof. In fact, you'll find him on the web. You can volunteer. I'm sure he'd be delighted to have some more uh, uh, experimental su <laughs> subjects. Um, uh, he wasn't doing this just for fun. Uh, he wanted to find out whether time really changes when you are really, really scared. They asked some of these people how they felt, and they said, I was shit scared. I think that means very scared. <laughs> and they said that the fall had taken five or six seconds, whereas in fact it took only three, same as it would have taken me off the Leaning Tower. So clearly they felt that time had gone slower or expanded or something. So what he did was to make them a wristwatch, a special wristwatch, on which was a random number, say 37, flashing with its negative about 100 times a second, which is too fast for you to be able to see in normal life. You can't dis distinguish it. All they could see was a blur. And he reckoned if they looked at it on the way down, they might be able to see the number. You'll see some of them didn't even try. <laughs> Students. But most of them did try, and they looked at it, and they could not see the number. And so he reckoned that what's going on, time doesn't change. Time ticks on relentlessly, like uh, Isaac Newton said. 
But what happens is that if you are really scared, the amygdala, which is a tiny little feature right in the middle of your brain, it kicks into high gear and it takes in masses of information very fast. And afterwards, your brain makes up a story and says, ah, there's so much information, that must have taken a long time. And so looking back on it, you see it all as happening very slowly because you've got to expand the sh sh small amount of stuff that's happened into that long time frame. So if you remember, if you've been in a car crash, and you remember it, you can see cars going very slowly like this into the ditch or wherever it's happening. Of course, it didn't really happen like that. That's the story your brain makes up afterwards. That's all to do with Sue's stuff about consciousness. Anyway, uh, let's not go there. So as I say, look up David Egerman, and you can volunteer your services. <laughs> These are the tiny fractions of time which we've invented. Thousandths of a second, millionths of a second, billionths of a second, and it goes all the way down to attoseconds, which are billionths of billionths of a second. There, have been more, there are more attoseconds in one second than there have been seconds in the whole history of the universe. So attoseconds are quite short. But even these short intervals of time affect us quite a bit. For example, if you get stung by a jellyfish, it can fire a poison dart, a stylet, into you in less than a microsecond. It's one of the fastest movements in the animal kingdom. It will fire this stylet in about 700 nanoseconds into your leg. You can't stop it. It's no good seeing a jellyfish and saying, hang on a sec, I'll get my leg out of the way. You're, you're, you're hours too late. But the good, news, the good news is you won't feel the pain for a million times longer because pain nerves actually transmit the information rather slowly. And this is odd. Uh, you can test it for yourself. Well, actually, I would suggest you get somebody else to test it. If you kick a rock, you'll feel the pressure at once, but you won't feel the pain for a couple of seconds. It actually takes, uh, it only travels about a meter a second. And about two seconds later, you'll feel, oh. Or another thing, if you burn your fingers on a hot stove, you know it's going to hurt but you often have time to get over to the cold tap and put your fingers under the tap before you feel the pain, because it does take a second, a second and a half to get to your brain. Very strange. It takes quite a long time for the pain to get to you. So these milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds actually affect our daily lives. And here we come to a crucial, critical experiment for which I need your help. Um, I have here two balloons. Uh, shall we have the... Yeah, let's have the camera on again, if you could possibly do that. And I'll move the balloon. I need another volunteer. This is dangerous. <laughs> a volunteer for a dangerous, a dangerous experiment? Come on, somebody can do a dangerous experiment. Yeah, good, good, good. Thank you. Now, health and safety. This is sharp. Okay. Okay, don't poke it in my eye. Okay. Don't poke it in your eye. Okay, right. Now, we have here two balloons, and what I would like you to do is to hold this up by the flights like this, and hold it up here, and we're on the count of three, we'll make them count, drop it into that balloon, okay? Okay. Sure, now just wait a minute. You see what's going to happen? Oh, we've lost the picture. The balloon, the balloon is going to be punctured by the dart. It will go pop, I tell you that, but... The question is, will it go bang? Will it explode outwards, bang? Or will it implode inwards? Will it go gnab? That's the opposite of bang. <laughs> or will it do something else? Now, could we have some house lights up, please, for a minute? I'd like a vote for bang, please. Who thinks it will go bang outwards? Hands? About half. Who thinks it will go gnab inwards? Oh, rather more. Who thinks it will do something else? Two, three, no, no, about ten. All right, hold it up high. We're going to count him in, right? Three, two. Yeah, yeah, good. Hold it up high, up high. Yeah, right, are you ready? Three, two, one, go. Hey, which was it? They weren't watching. We're going to have to do the other one. Right, now, what, will you watch this time? Will you please watch, okay? <laughs> Pay attention. Right, are you ready? Okay. Right, ready? Three, two, one, go! What was it? <laughs> Thank you very much. That was very brave. Yeah. 
And could we go back, I'm sorry, could we go back to the, um, the slides, please? So the thing is, you can't see. You can look as hard as you like, but you can't see. It's too fast for the eye. With the eye, you can detect maybe a tenth of something happening in maybe a tenth of a second, possibly faster than that, but not in a, a millisecond. And this is what happens. Within about one millisecond, the whole balloon splits from end to end. I did hundreds of balloons, literally hundreds. Almost in every case, they, go, they split from end to end to begin with. This, incidentally, is taken with high-speed flash. The flash lasts only a, a, a tenth of a second, oh, a tenth of a millisecond, a hundred, a hundred microseconds. And even here, you can see that the edges of the rubber are all blurred. It's moving very fast, maybe 250 meters a second. So within one millisecond, it is split. Now, there is then a problem, because there is air in the middle. The rubber is trying to contract, but it can't. It can't push the air out of the way fast enough, not at this time scale. So it doesn't go outwards. It doesn't go inwards. What it has to do is unwrap itself from around that cushion of air. Um, so here is the second last picture. And eventually, you just get three tangled bits of rubber on the floor. And you can see where the dart hit the balloon. The air is still sitting there in the middle. The rubber is collapsing around the, the cushion of air. And you wind up almost always with three pieces of rubber. Let's see if we've got them here. We've got one bit of pink, we've got one bit of pink, and the other one's gone. Well, usually three. I, I wound up with so much rubber on my floor that my, my girlfriend got rather cross with me. Uh, she may have forgiven me by now. We got married since. So, <laughs> so that is too fast to see with the eye. So we do need these milliseconds and microseconds and so on. That is the end of my talk, ladies and gentlemen. And I'd be very happy to answer any questions you have after the next talk. So thank you very much indeed for listening. Now.